Heidegger's critique of technology is probably one of the best known texts by Heidegger to a wider public audience and probably also a text that inspires most interest with people who are usually perhaps not so much interested in Heidegger. And a common, well, shall we say, a common misconception about Heidegger is that he despises technology, that he is against technology and that he wants to return to sort of a, an idealized natural golden state where there was no technology and where there was um, just a you know regular tool used and Heidegger is sort of a Luddite who wishes to return to a peasant state, return back time for a thousand years. That the author of Being in Time is perfectly aware that time cannot be reversed, should be clear. Now, in Heidegger's own words, he's not against technology. In an interview that he gave to Richard Wisser just a few years before his death, Heidegger says the following, and I quote him directly. I am not against technology. I have never spoken out against technology nor against the so-called demonic nature of technology. I rather try to understand the essence of technology. I see in technology, in its essence, that human beings stand under a power that challenges them and in which human beings are no longer free. That something announces itself here, namely a relation between being and human being, and that this relation, which hides itself in technology, one day comes to light. Now, we don't have to worry about what Heidegger has to say towards the end of this statement, but it's very important that Heidegger here very clearly says that he asks for the essence of technology, and that this essence is something related to being itself. In fact, being itself in its current era, in its current sending, posits beings as a standing reserve, as Heidegger called. So everything becomes perfectly available at any time. And this is why, for example, regular anthropological theories of technology can fall short of what technology is and how it permeates everything. Because the ordinary story is that we just use more and more complex tools and that there really isn't much of a difference between a hammer and a nuclear bomb or a space rocket that we can use to fly to the moon. Now, whoever doesn't see that there is a difference between splitting the atom and using that vast amount of energy and using a hammer will never understand what Heidegger has to say about technology anyways. Now, what Heidegger is after, first of all, is to at least question what technology is and how it changes everything and where it actually comes from. Because what we see is that we just see it as an instrumental, um, the instrumental definition of technology is just, oh, we just use it, it's just more sophisticated. Um, but that's not what's going on. Because what technology does, what modern technology allows us to do is, or rather, because technology for Heidegger is not you know, not your laptop, it's not the, the phone that I'm using right now to record um, this, this talk. It's rather technology or the essence of technology is that beings are changed in a way that they appear differently to us. And they appear as standing reserve and they appear as sources of energy. Everything can become a source of energy one way or another, including the human being. The human being is, is actually the most important resource in all of this. This is why we speak of human resources. This is why we speak of 
resourcing human talent or human capital. Now, that unquestioned, that we, we act on all of this unquestioned, and that, for example, very often we say something like, oh, we, we, must, um, we must live up to the challenges of technology, or we must get ready for the digital age. We must do what we can to, um, to keep up with the changes. That shows something, and this is, was something that was already present in Heidegger's days. And what this shows is that even though the human being tells itself tells himself that we are in fact in charge of technology and we run the show, but with these everyday articulation we can read every day in the news or hear somewhere on the radio or somewhere else, what this tells us is that we are not in charge. Is that technology comes from somewhere else. And Heidegger, in an essay, not on technology, but on language, interestingly, says that we are now at a crossroads where we either move further towards a world of machines or we move back to the world of humans. Now, the world of machines is the world of, 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 of intelligence explosion, is the world where anything is, is a world of, of a perfect positive feedback loop. Now Heidegger's philosophy is all about thinking the negative so radically that it doesn't even require any kind of beings anymore, but that's maybe something for a different talk. But what technology does, it presents us with a perfect availability, a perfect presence, everything is available all the time. And the ultimate expression of that is the internet. In the internet, there is literally no time. The internet functions because it has homogenized time to a literal standing now. Everything is always open. You can access any website at any time from anywhere because time has been flattened online. And that is something that Heidegger could not even foresee. But the question for Heidegger is, where does technology come from? And he looks for it in metaphysics. Now, he says that the Greeks understood being as physis, where we get the word physics from. Now, what is physis? It is self-growth, but it's a self-growth. For example, you plant a seed and then you see the plant the flower growing and blooming. But what you never see here is physics itself. You never see that which brings that growth. So physics, as Heraclitus says, physics likes to hide itself. Physics gryptistai file. This is the fundamental movement of being. And physics is, in one word, to simplify matters, is natural. Now, the human being is also, of course, a being of physis. We are organic beings, we procreate, but we also access the world in a different manner. We have access to the world by techne, which means where we get the word technology from, which means art, and it means, but also means craft, but it can also mean instrument. And Heidegger says that what has happened is sort of a, a reduction in, in interpretation of what it means to be and what it means to, to use techno. So we've reduced it to a mere instrumental access and have begun to manipulate nature more and more over the course of the last thousands of years. But that's not all. There's something else that's going on in physics or something else that's going on in, in being. And Heidegger thinks that metaphysics, by forgetting, by forgetting the negative or forgetting absence or forgetting that which is not present, right? So physics is itself gives presence but withdraws. And metaphysics, Heidegger believes, 
forgets that aspect. And by forgetting that, we enter a metaphysics of presence, a metaphysics of availability. And technology is nothing but the manifestation or real, real world instantiation of metaphysical ideas and concepts. So everything is perfectly present all the time. There is no death, there is no decay, there is nothing that's not ever present, anything that's not present or anything as Max Planck said, anything that's not measurable is not real. So only what's measurable is real. There's, this is also, by the way, just to point this out really briefly, the structural logical reason why Silicon Valley um, egomaniacs want to live forever. That, that's not necessarily just because they are completely full of themselves. That, the reason is really structural. It's logical. It's for them, death is, if anything, at best an evil, or at worst, death to them is not real. Death is not even real. Death is a mistake. It's an error. It's a problem, as Harari literally says. Harari says in an interview, he says, death is a problem now to be solved by technology. Death is just a problem. Because why, where is this coming from? Because they want sheer and total availability and presence. Everything has to be present. You could even understand Amazon. Maybe a bit of a strange example. But if you think of Amazon uh, as you know, wh wh where it's, what it's working toward, what it's trying to establish, which is you click a button and whatever you have just ordered, very important, ordered, right? It is delivered to you, is given to you, presented to you within the hour. So that kind of a sheer availability. But, th but so that's just one very practical, maybe visible example, but it's everywhere and everything becomes a resource. That there's no difference between, actually between human beings and animals and plants. It's all just there for the increase of power, for the increase of an ever-growing demand of a will to will, as Heidegger calls it, a will to will that wills itself but doesn't know why it will itself. Ask someone who is in the business of optimization why they are optimizing something. They will tell you that they optimize for the sake of making something better. Then you ask why and they will say, well, to make it more efficient. And you ask them, why do you make it more efficient? Well, so, it's, so it works better and smoother, etc. It never ends. The will to will is circular. That means it's meaningless. It's utterly meaningless. Heidegger does say in a text called um, what is called metaphysic, uh, what is called thinking, was heißt denken, that the that technology will soon show. This is in the late fifties. He says technology will soon show its true face, and that is that it is nothing but a revolution. That means a recurring or a returning or a re repeating, a, re a repetition of the ever same, and we see this already happening. Music is no longer in any way or form an expression of human creativity. Music now is literally just... Uh, music sounds the same. There's, there's no... Music continues to be the same. Music continues to be forever an re a repetition. There are musicologists, of all people, who say that within the next 50 years, we will have reduced our, our musical standards to four chords. We will not need more. And we will always hear the same thing. And this is good because this is who we physically are. And now all of this is pointing towards a, a total reduction of, of who we are and, 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 what, and how we have access to the world. And what's so striking, though, is for Heidegger, there is a way out. There is an exit. And that exit is Besinnung and Gelassenheit. So Besinnung is contemplation and thinking. 
and Gelassenheit is a releasedness and a stepping back. And the Besinnung, the, the thinking or the contemplation part, means to contemplate history. It means to contemplate where this comes from and how there could be an exit. For example, he says that we must return to understanding and question. Right? Always question, always ask, ask, ask. Why? Where is it coming from? Why is it here? What is it doing to us? And then say, okay, we have the capacity, we have the ability to step back. So we think through our history, where we come from, and then we release ourselves from the current prevalent mode because nothing, to say this very bluntly, for Heidegger, nothing lasts forever. Now, this is Heidegger's human response to the challenge of technology. However, when we move over to someone more dark, like Deleuze, and Guattari, then the story becomes much more complicated and also a lot less hopeful. Because for in a Deleuzean understanding of technology, technology is coming from the future. And that future is radically non-human, maybe even anti-human, using the human being, the human spirit, for its own instantiation and actualization. So the intelligence explosion of the last five, six hundred years in modernity is that arrival of the future that is absolutely not human. And I call that just the it, das is. It's just an it. And you can see this already happening to human beings that they are, that there will be an increasing number of human beings identifying as neutral, as neuter, no longer with the gender, no longer with any sex. It's coming, that alien, very foreign, non-human force is pushing into our presence, into our history, and using us as a host and trying to uh, use our energy, our knowledge, our understanding, to, well, to boost itself. We are nothing but sort of a hardware, software that this alien future needs. And when we bring Heidegger and Deleuze into dialogue, which they never were, then I think that when Heidegger says that we are no longer free, he doesn't say that we should subject or succumb to it. I think he does acknowledge here and and this is the in in the late 60s when he says this i think that he's already then and he's not saying this in his essays on technology necessarily explicitly but he's saying it here in this interview that i quoted at the beginning of this talk he does say there is probably something not human at work and something that's not even off being now to bring heidegger and deleuze into dialogue with Deleuze we see that there is this possibility of an alien invasion from the future pushing itself into our time into our being now in order to provide an exit we should I think turn to Heidegger and think through our history of thinking again and find within those exits. Because the Platonic cave does provide an exit if we only think concealment, absence and withdrawal and go back to the Heraclitean understanding of Physis, that Physis likes to hide itself. Because this alien force is all about presence. It's all about making everything available as a standing resource, homogenized, absolutely sterilized, and terribly, terribly flattened and exploited so that, so that it feels more and more empty and a, a growing void. It's 
So that kind of a nihilism, maybe this is what Nietzsche also meant when he spoke of nihilism and that Platonism was a bulwark against nihilism, that Christianity was a bulwark against nihilism. So we might see actually a great return to Christianity and other religions over the next decades as this alien force shows its true face more more clearly and more and more in its true ugliness. Now, Heidegger provides this exit, I think, again, by going back in our history and thinking it through again and thinking and seeing what maybe was only there implicitly but hasn't been made explicit. And this is why we must not abandon the study of our origins.